Okay. Hi, welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman, and I am so glad you're here with us today. I have um, a very special guest named Manya Chalinski here with me today to chat with you. To chat with you, she is a communication specialist and a survivor who helps people live lives. Oh my God, I'm not stopping. I will cut this out. I'm going to wave. I don't know what my problem is. Let me fix this sentence. This is what's tripping me up. Mm. Okay. I needed commas. I, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. This has never happened before. <laughs> of course, this That's is all right. We're, we're just so comfortable with each other. I have no problem with this. Okay, good. This is episode four. So, all right. Okay. Just so that I remember where we are. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman, and I am very glad that you're here. On today's episode, episode number four, I have Manya Chalinski with me. She is a communication specialist, and she helps people whose lives have been touched by trauma understand how resiliency and compassion are part of the path to healing. And we're all about healing here. And she enables them to live their best lives. She's an entrepreneur who has used her own experience as a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing to help others understand the importance of recognizing the psychological impacts of violence. Her story has been told in the Boston Globe and the Buffalo News and on All Things Considered, and she has shared her insights about being a survivor for Self Magazine. She's talked about her experience on podcasts like Mental and You, Me, Empathy, and she has spoken about the importance of validating invisible victims of trauma on stages from the International Association of Business Communicators World Conference, the Pennsylvania Governor's Emergency Management Conference, and the National Homeland Security Conference, and SXX. W. That's a mouthful. I'm exhausted just reading that. Welcome, Manya. I'm so glad that you're here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be talking to you today. That's a wonderful thing. Um, your experience is uh, quite, quite traumatic. I, I guess I gather from this that you were on a very different path initially, and then after the 2013 bombing, everything shifted. Yes. I'm not sure I could tell you what path I actually was on. It Bef the day before this all happened, but it definitely changed the trajectory of my life. Didn't really realize how much at the time, I don't think I thought I was going to become an advocate. Right. I just was busy dealing with healing and trying to figure out what had happened to me and what did it mean and how was I going to get through it all? Yeah, I think that that uh, for most of us who have changed directions in our lives, it kind of happens that way. When we're in in it, it just seems like it's incrementally happening over a slow period of time because it's all sort of organically unfolding. But then when you're taking a, a look back, you're like, oh, wow, look at that trajectory. You know, like you can find the flashpoint where things changed. It's interesting. Okay. So I usually begin the interviews with a few questions that I've assembled because I am um, a, a fan of these same questions being asked, asked and answered by different people because I love to hear the different answers. It was originally on uh, on the meet, the actor studio. I don't remember the guy who did it, but um, the bearded guy with the yes. glasses and it was yes. a very dark stage and he did this actor studio thing. And at the end, he had the same set of questions that he asked of everybody. And I just, I just have always been like fascinated by that. So um, what five words would you use to describe yourself? So I'm not even sure what I wrote in the- No, 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 uh, just go for it. Pre-show. So the five words I would use to describe myself would say um, responsible, definitely okay. sometimes feel overly responsible for things, um, compassionate, serious, and then just to completely contrast that, I think I can be funny. I'm and sure. I'm very loyal. That's those are great qualities. I love that. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. It's who I am. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I tend to be, I think, on the serious side when I'm talking about something that I feel is very important. But I can also be a total cut up hysterical, but I have to be really comfortable with the person to let that side out. 
you know, but I yes. think sometimes people think I'm very serious and then I come out with some weird one liner and they're like, wait, did that come from Marcy? You know, like I get it. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, all right. Number two, what is your favorite way to spend a day? You know, I love going for long walks. I live in Boston and as happens for all of us, I haven't always kind of explored all the areas around me. You just kind of get stuck in my neighborhood. Sure. So I like to go out on a weekend day and pick a spot in the city and just either walk there or get myself there on the subway and walk back and try to do a different route every time. So wow. I might start in some of the same places, but just take a different road home just to walk down different streets. I really love looking at people's houses and trying to imagine what it's like to live there and yeah. seeing the neighborhoods and what shops are there and kind of get a feel for the vibe. So that's been something that I have been able to even do throughout the pandemic. Sure. Cause it's really, so distant. You're walking by yourself. Exactly. Get myself out there and kind of um, get some fresh check air. out parts of the city I haven't been to before. That's a very cool answer. I, I have not done that, but I like when I'm driving around or walking around a neighborhood at night and the, I look in people's houses if they have their windows open and I get to see how they've decorated their houses. Yes, you know, I love that. Or not decorated their houses. Like I'm, I, I'm a, a, a painter also, a visual artist. And, and every single wall of every single room in my house has art on it. And I'm surprised at how many people don't hang anything on their walls. I know. I agree with you. I'm also one of those people who loves looking in open curtains and I'm not really interested out. in what the people are doing though. I'm, I'm interested in what they, how they've decorated their houses. I don't want people to think I'm a voyeur or a peeping Tom or something, you know? And, well, I didn't cause I do the same thing and it's entirely to see the decoration. And if I can get a sense of the layout of the room. Sure. I have been known to in my head, redecorate spaces that I'm in. So I'm in a shop and I just think, well, if this were my shop, how would I have it decorated? And then completely redo things in my head. And so I do that as I'm walking by and I'm taking a peek, you're like, oh, I wouldn't have put the TV on that wall. I would right. put it here. And it, and you, like you said, I'm not even really paying attention to the people. It's the decoration. <laughs> right. I think we're, we're closet uh, interior designers or something. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Now going back in your memory, what is your favorite childhood memory? You this know, is a hard one. I have been thinking about the dog we had growing up a lot recently. Her name was Sparky and she had hair that was vaguely the same color as my hair. And on the weekends, on Saturdays, I think, I would take her for a walk to the park um, in our neighborhood and that's the park where the little league baseball teams played. And so they had a snack bar and I would buy their donuts, which were, you know, freshly made and so delicious. And I would wow. get, a, you know, an order of them and then I would share them with Sparky. And that was like our little outing. Aww. And I remember- Yes, dogs like, love donuts. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure, but she certainly uh, seemed to enjoy them, even if just <laughs> even if just for my sake. Well, so and, much sugar. How could they not? I know. And one day I remember somebody asked me if I was out with my sister because her hair was the same color as mine. And I just remembered being so tickled to think of, you know, my precious Sparky as if she was my sister. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. That's really sweet. Do you have any idea how old you were? I'm thinking 10, 11, 12 in that okay. range. Yeah. That's very cool. I like that. And, you know, you could have a loving connection with somebody in a different species and it's just as dynamic and compassionate and nurturing and a nice little love bubble with the dog. That's all. Love bubble. I really like that. I think we did have a love bubble. You know, we spoke different languages, but we understood each other. 
That's awesome. I, at love bubble is not my phrase. I just, I'm listening to a book called Burnout by um, two, two twin sisters whose last name is Nagoski. And, and they were just talking about that you can have these compassionate love bubbles with your sister or your best friend or your, your significant other or someone in your family or even the family dog, you know. And so that's what I just thought of. I, I listened to it two hours ago. So I just love the love bubble idea. It's just so perfect for me. Okay. Favorite meal. Oh, this one changes based on mood, as you can imagine. Of course. Well, you know, we're recording this not long after Thanksgiving. And I will say that, you know, the traditional Thanksgiving meal, the turkey, mashed potatoes. Um, well, actually, we could just stop there. Those are my favorite, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, some throw a veggie in there somewhere, uh, stuffing. Maybe a little stuffing, yeah. Yeah, you know, pumpkin pie, apple pie, like it, the full fixings, that makes me very, very happy. Yeah, I was quite thrilled for Thanksgiving. It was just my husband and my daughter and I, and I cooked a very, sm ooh, a very small portion of the Thanksgiving feast, and it was heaven. I know. It was so good. Yeah, it, it does change. Some days I might answer sushi. Other days I might answer chicken parmesan. Um, some days I might answer a pear and pecan salad from this Italian restaurant down the street, you know. <laughs> you know, in the summertime, I would probably just, my answer would be one word, tomatoes. Oh. I just, I have made myself what I will call a meal just of tomatoes because they're wow. fresh and juicy in the summer and so delicious. Absolutely. Um, so you're right. It's a little bit mood and season, but yeah. 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 I think so. Okay. Um, what one piece of advice would you like to give your younger self? Oh, the piece of advice I would give my younger self, I think is to trust a little bit more to trust myself and to trust the people in my life. I think that's been at different times a challenge for me. Um, and somehow I'm just not sure that my younger self ever really got that message, especially the trusting myself part. I'm that's kind of, huge. That's huge. You know, when I, if I'm scared that's there's a reason for it and trust that if i'm absolutely excited or feeling a connection to sort of go with that and believe that that's that's a real thing sure um, do you think it, that there was something in your life that kept you from trusting what you innately felt on the inside you know i'm not sure uh, anything specifically i i am an introvert i've always been kind of quiet and enjoy those kind of hobbies and um, tend to not, I think even as a young child tended to not really seek out large groups or kind of that. Right. And I don't know if that natural introversion just sort of. Yeah, it could be. Turned into that. I'm, I'm not really sure. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I grew up not trusting myself and feeling a very big, contrast or disconnect, disharmony between what I felt on the inside and what was happening to me in the environment on the outside. And instead of realizing that what was on the outside was kind of bullshit, <laughs> I took that as what should be. And I discounted what I was feeling. And so I always felt off balance. I always was distrustful, but of my own instincts and, and, and uh, innate thoughts about what was going on. And it took me quite a long time in therapy to sort of write that balance. So that's why I asked that. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I'm not sure what causes it, but I do think it's a pretty human condition to question ourselves and how oh, we're feeling. And if, the outside and the inside don't match. I'm not sure why we all just assume the outside must be right. Um, well, but I think it's just sort of human nature that it's much easier for us to believe negative things about ourselves than positive things yeah. about ourselves. And that it takes a lot of work to flip that script and really realize that those negative things most of the time are not true. 
Right. You no, know, I grew up feeling like I was not feeling like I was, but I grew up actually being gaslit most of the time. Mm. And so I, I was always, it was like my relationship with my mother was just crazy making, you know, she could get it in her mind that the sky was green and the grass was blue. And she, by the end of the conversation, she'd have me questioning everything and I'd be believing her, you know, so it's, it's hard to be balanced with that. So it can be. And (laughs) one of the things that I started doing as an adult uh, just recently really is thinking to myself, if a friend was telling me this about themselves, would I believe them? And realizing that every time the answer was, of course, I would believe them and I would trust them. That is a really good strategy. And it's been really helpful to help me learn to trust myself more and kind of, you know, be a little steadier with some of those things, realizing, oh yeah. Or, or kind of conversely, if I was talking to a friend, would she be saying to me the things that I'm saying to myself in my head? No, absolutely. Of course not. And would you say those things that you say that little, or those, those hateful internal dialogue things that all we all women say to ourselves, would you ever say that to someone else? Even somebody you didn't like, let alone someone you loved mm-hmm. never. Mm-mm. You'd never look at your friend and go, oh my God, your thighs. How are you even going to go out of the house? You look awful in those shorts. You'd never say that. And yet, uh, uh, hello, guilty, guilty. I say it to myself. And I've, I've, I've purposely, consciously been working on not doing that anymore. Yes. Agreed. I have, that has been something I've had to work on as well. And, you know, to... and talking about trusting myself, but to also be thoughtful about what I'm hearing from myself. Because as we've just shown, there's examples when I might be telling myself something that really isn't what's happening. So right. I've, I've learned to trust and recognize that side of me to recognize, okay, that's, that's not coming from a good place. That isn't something a friend would say. That's not something I would say to a friend. So right it's okay to, you know, try to make it stop. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's on the path to a healthy living, on the path to self-love and acceptance and all that happy stuff, all that good stuff. Okay, last question. What is the one thing you would most like to change about the world? Oh, I think this one is pretty easy for me. I want the world in general and leadership in particular to be more trauma sensitive. Yeah. We just aren't. If you, uh, There's so many different ways that we aren't trauma sensitive. And so many individuals have experience of, of trauma, whether it's trauma from a particular event, like a violent episode or a natural disaster, or it's you know, sort of community trauma, or it's the ongoing trauma of poverty or racism. We've got a lot of people who are, you know, maybe being crushed by this. And I don't think we're doing a great job of leading to be inclusive of people who have experienced something like that. Oh, we're definitely not. I read a statistic today saying that, that normally, it's something like 26% of American adults report some sort of mental illness mm-hmm. um, related to trauma, anxiety, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And now in COVID, as of like early November, that's up to like 58%. I believe that completely. Absolutely. So now more than ever between the COVID pandemic and all of the um, familial uh, strife that that can cause and finances and the economy and, and working and teaching kids from home and, you know, leadership and government and healthcare and, you know, people worried about their, their survival and they're worried about everything that they can control. Plus we have racism coming to a a head and the black lives movement, which is extremely important. And thank goodness it's, it's things are starting to change and the mindset's shifting, but there's so much stress, you know, and I, I, I think that, we need to do more in mental health care. We need to do more to destigmatize uh, trauma. Uh, you know what I'm saying? 
I, I, I do. And I, it's, you know, when the pandemic started lockdown in, in March, I wrote a piece for my blog, just talking about, you know, this is a slow motion, natural disaster. Yeah. So for me, you know, what happened to me, which I know we'll get to in a moment happened in less than a minute and it was over. And then we, I moved on to what do I do about this? Right. But we're still in the actual yeah. event that is causing death and destruction and damage and pain on so many different levels. So we, can't even get to a point yet where we're recovering from this because right. we're still in it. And, you know, I've started to see inklings of some more trauma sensitive leadership. I think, you know, some folks are getting it right. I think some folks are definitely not getting it right. Um, but, you know, if I had a magic wand, that's the thing I would change. That's a, a wonderful thing. Let's hope that we're on that right path now. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to it a little bit. Um, so you, like you, like you had said, were present during the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, and then instantly things changed. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, I am not a runner, but was a big fan of the marathon primarily because I live not far from the finish line, and it's just this big party. So, you know, who would take the day off? Of I know, take the day off always and just show up to be there for the party. And um, since I live so close to the finish line, I was always pretty close. In 2013, a friend got us passes for uh, the bleacher seats and nice. they were good for two o'clock on. And I think that's right. And uh, so that was awesome because then you could actually see, you know, I wasn't right lined up at the finish line, but I was pretty darn close and you could see people. So it was really exciting. And so that's where we were standing in the bleachers um, when the first bomb went off directly across the street from me. Wow. And, you know, I, I can't even imagine froze in place. I knew it was a bomb. And I say that because in conversations with people afterwards, I know many people didn't think it was a bomb. People thought it was a water cannon. People thought it was a maybe a gas line explosion. Uh, but for some reason, I knew it was a bomb. And huh. one of, it didn't have very many- I would have had nothing to compare that to, so. You know, I, I didn't really have anything to compare it to either, but somehow I just knew it was a bomb. And in as much as I was having any thoughts, I thought to myself, they just ruined the Boston Marathon. Yeah. And I stood there frozen, you know, tunnel vision looking at across the street and, you know, where before there had been a crowd of people and uh, the, there's a fence that separates the crowd from the course and their flags on top of it. So it was just colorful and exciting sure. and a lot going on. And now the, it looked to me as if there was nothing across the street. I couldn't see yeah. any people, um, sort of everybody kind of ran away. And then it looked to me like there was nobody there. And I was staring, I was frozen in place. I couldn't see anything else. I couldn't hear anything. And I saw a woman off to the side of my vision, she was standing in front of what at the time was a lens crafters. They had a big plate glass window that had been shattered. Oy. And in my brain was trying to process, how is she standing there? Like so yeah. close to this place where this bomb just went off. And as my brain was trying to click over and process that, the second bomb went off. Oh no. Down, down halfway down the street going to do that again. The second bomb went off halfway down the block on that same side of the street. And I turned to look at it and saw the smoke rising and, and knew it was another bomb. Wow. And the only 
the only thought or feeling or anything I had was we have to get out of here. Yeah. And I said that to one of my friends who I was with, and um, I looked down at my feet because we were on, on bleachers, which sure. have different level steps. And, and in as much as I knew I was surrounded by people, even though I wasn't seeing anybody, I knew I had to watch where I was going to get out. And exiting the bleachers took us closer to the bombing site. Um, oh, because you're going down towards them. Because we're going down towards the street. But I never looked back across the street. Once that second bomb went off and I looked down at my feet, I never looked back across the street. And yeah, you probably didn't want to see what you would have seen. I am so grateful that whatever was going on in my brain, it knew we are just not going to look back across the street. Um, I have now seen videos and and can tell you what was happening across the street, but it's right. not something that I experienced in the What moment. happened to the woman standing in front of the lens crafters? You know, I actually, believe it or not, have met her now. And wow. um, she is, uh, you know, basically fine. She was not, she was physically injured, not as severely as some people. Sure. Um, I remember thinking after it happened, I have to watch the news. I have to figure out who this person was, but that isn't how it happened. Um, it was actually a few years later in a, with a group of survivors that I met her. And then it was probably a full year after that, that I was looking at the video again and was able to put the two together. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if when you met her, you recognized her from your memory, but no, it was no, not that. at all. Wow. What a horrific experience. Now, I don't remember specifically, there were a few deaths, weren't there? A lot yes. of injuries, but a few a few runners got killed, I think. Uh, no runners were killed. The three people were killed essentially instantly, and they were spectators. I, um, there that's, are that's uh, five people who were killed in the whole incident, two police officers, one who died as a result of... Um, the firefight a few days later and one who was um, killed by the bombers the night before the firefight. So, um, you know, and the bombing directly was, was three people. And then um, I think the number is 18 people who lost either one or both legs wow. in the bombing. So that was very catastrophic yeah. physical injuries. Um, and several hundred people with varying other levels of physical injuries. Wow. And then a ton of people suffering from PTSD and emotional trauma and probably noise related fears and, and wow. Absolutely. And that, you know, I fall into that crowd. I walked away luckily without any physical injuries and, you know, my, the reason we're even talking today is in part because the response from the city and the state and everybody largely, although not completely, largely ignored the psychological impacts. Um, the city has a list of people they consider survivors who get invited to things and et cetera. Um, and that list does not include people like myself who were mentally um, traumatized. It's only yeah. physical people with the, medical people with the, issues. People with mental health wounds. Um, we've really had to advocate hard to be included. And, uh, you know, still to this day, I, I could share with you, I will not, but I could share with you a litany of stories of, of the little things that were done that were just so hurtful mm. that, is how I come to realizing how important trauma-sensitive leadership is. Well, it's the it's the realization of that that is the key to to changing it. Not necessarily harping on all those other things. Right. I'm sorry they happened to you, but they brought you to us and to the world. So, you know, things happen for a reason, I suppose. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I fully believe in the thing. Ha things happen for a reason, but I do believe that. You know the the old saying: we can't control what happens to us, but we can control what we do Our response to it about it. And 
like I mentioned earlier, not that I necessarily knew this is the direction I was moving early on, um, but when it got to the point where I could think about what do I want and what am I doing, I made some very conscious choices to try to make a real change um, based on how hurtful and painful it was and continues to be when, when you're invisible after something like this happens. Yeah. It's dismissive. It's disrespectful. It's, it's the opposite of empathy. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. What is the opposite of empathy? I was just thinking, what is the word that's the I opposite don't know. of empathy? Well, whatever Dismissa- it is. We- dismissal, maybe? I think maybe. We don't like it, whatever it is. No. Yeah, what? definitely. Definitely. <laughs> okay. So, so this tra- traumatic thing happens and you're trying to heal yourself. And in the process of trying to heal yourself, you decide that this healing process would be good for everybody. And so you've become an advocate. Yes. And early on, I, and it's interesting because you said I decided this would be better for every, this would be helpful for everybody. In there the beginning, no there definitely was no. no decision. I wrote a letter. It was more organic. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was very organic. I just got really angry. And I don't think it's uncommon to be very angry after some an experience like this. And to right. me, that anger was entirely directed at the response and the and the the people who ignored people like me. So over the summer after the bombing, I wrote some letters. I'm a writer, I'm a sure. communicator. I'm like, I can write a letter. This is great. To our mayor, to some of the state representatives, our governor and got a varying levels of response. Um, most people weren't able to necessarily make any real changes, but a lot of people did sit down and listen. Who didn't listen is the mayor of my city who probably never saw the letter. I got an email that was signed the mayor's correspondent staff it was not even signed with somebody's name. Wow. And they said, the city has nothing to do with this. Call this number and they can help you. And it was a number that specifically was not able to help me. It was only for people with physical injuries. Uh-huh. And I had even said that in the letter, like, right. I can't access these this service. Um, can you help? And I even offered to help them, but so I got this dismissive letter back from the from the mayor that was that was so insensitive. No matter what the subject line, what, no matter what the subject you were talking about was, right. but the fact that I was reaching out as a traumatized person saying, "Can you help me?" and they're asking your elected was, official, and then you got dismissed. Right, and the response was so dismissive, and not I didn't even get the courtesy of a name of the person right. who signed the letter. And that is really what I think focused my anger and my energies on, on sort of the system and, right. and, you know, particularly the leadership in the city, but the system in general and realizing, you know, this isn't just me. They're not just ignoring me. This no, isn't just ignoring everyone. Right. This isn't just Boston. I think this happens. I started to realize it happens in other places too. And I thought it, it's systemic dismissal. Right. And and I have a voice and I need to fight this. And then slowly started to realize, oh, that means I'm going to be helping others because I, I can't help me. It already happened and it's not going to change. So how can I help so that other people don't experience this after they, you know. Right, so their aftermath would be different. Right, right, right. You know, after I wrote that letter, I was talking to uh, a victim advocate and I remember I was sitting across the table from her and we were talking about how, how would I respond to that letter? Did it make sense to keep reaching out to the city and to, you know, what was going to be the next step? And in that conversation, she said to me, how long have you been an advocate? Wow. And and I said, I'm not an advocate. (laughs) Like, what are you even talking about? Right. So she named it. She named it. And that's, 
I still didn't really take that label for myself for a really long time. But that was the first time I realized, oh, this it's I'm this advocating anger who don't have a voice. Right. Yeah. And it's this anger that's driving me because I said to her, I'm like, well, I don't know. I've just never been this angry before. And she says, yep, <laughs> <laughs> that'll do it. <laughs> that'll do it. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, so what is your main message as this uh, fledgling or you were fledgling, but as this um, very articulate communicative advocate, what is your main message about resiliency and recovery from trauma that you want the leaders to know or to start acting on? Yes. Well, thank you for asking that question because what I want to see is you know, an immediate and public validation of the mental health impacts of all of these kind of traumas that we're talking about, whether it is a violent episode, a mass tragedy like I was involved with, a school um, shooting, a school shooting, a um, natural disaster, or even something like COVID, right. to have it be publicly acknowledged by our leadership to say, we see you and we get that this is, um, you know, we get what's happening to you. And I, um, sorry, I have to stop for a second. Um, my computer just did something really weird. Okay. So I will wave so that you can see um, as you're watching on the video. I'm also marking down the time. So we're good. Okay. Um, can you repeat the question? Sure. Oh, my message, my message. Yes, 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 yes. So, so you become an advocate um, or, or, or are named an advocate as you are angry and approaching this problem, um, trying to get a voice to the people who are being overlooked. So you're, what, is, what is your main message about resiliency and recovery from trauma that you want leadership to act upon? Thank you for asking this question. You're welcome. I want leadership to publicly and loudly acknowledge the mental health impacts from violence and trauma and tragedy. It's known that the sooner people can recognize they're having a problem and the sooner they can get help, the better chance that they're not going to have lasting impacts, yeah. um, mental health impacts, and they're not going to develop something like PTSD or long-term issues. One of the things that prevents people from getting help immediately is not believing that something actually happened to them. Um, or and, how deeply it, it could affect them. Even right. If they did acknowledge that an event or an experience happened. Exactly. And when you don't see it on the news and, and the mayor of the city isn't talking about it, then it's quite easy to believe, well, it's just me, or it's not really a big thing, or it must not be real because nobody's talking about it. Right. And if we I were think to domestic violence uh, uh, survivors feel that way too. Yes. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. And if we can get that kind of recognition, now I speak specifically about, you know, mass violence and I talk to emergency managers and first responders and talk about how to communicate in the immediate aftermath of something like this. The message is the same for other kinds of violence, like you said, domestic violence, for other kinds of events like COVID. Sure. Um, it's unfortunately because of stigma about talking about mental health or admitting that we have mental health issues, it just, you know, puts the kibosh on communications and really effectively getting it out there. I mean, the we've heard for, for years that, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, I, um, I apologize, but we, we, we know for years, for a very long time, that, that returning um, uh, soldiers from the military who face horrible atrocities and horrible things come back and try to reacclimate themselves into civilian life and a lot of them have mental health issues and alcoholism and drug abuse and PTSD and the full range of mental health issues. And, and it seems sort of almost cliche that it, that there isn't enough mental health care for that, you know, right. you know, right. and so let alone the rest of us who weren't, didn't serve in the military, like what, what about us? This is the severe issue that's affecting a, a very large percentage of the population. 
It is. And, you know, one important thing that I want to make sure to, to, one thing that I want to make clear is that even going through something like a bombing or a school shooting or domestic violence, it does not mean you are going to have any kind of mental health condition or you're going to develop something diagnosable like PTSD or sure. it's important anything to say like that. Right. Um, you it's know, not a one to one ratio. No. No. Um, you know, most people after something like the bombing, or if we look at COVID, most people are going to have some struggles. They're going to have some distress to deal with it. And it's, you know, our own level of resiliency, how we recover from these kind of things based on our history, our previous traumas, you know, our support system, all of those good things. Many people are able to kind of move past something like this in a few days or a few weeks, just kind of brush it off. For some, it takes longer. Sure. Some people may need help, but that help doesn't have to be in the form of a mental health professional. It could be talking to other survivors. It could be talking to a member of your faith community, a clergy member. Um, it could be, you know, talking with a peer group, for example, for like first responders, for example. Sure. And the, the key is to recognize the distress and then to kind of deal with it as you need to. And when you get to that point where you feel like you can't deal with it on your own, you get some form of help. Right. Now, for me, that took the form of formal mental health treatment because that was something I understood and was comfortable with and have experience in the healthcare system sure. and, and trust the healthcare system. That's not gonna be the option for everybody. But the key is acknowledging it right away so people can kind of understand what's happening to them manage their own distress and you know know that they're going to be okay even right. if they need a formal help they're still going to be okay sure the, regardless of the the curves in the bend we will reach the other side right it's the keeping it under a bushel and pretending it didn't happen that adds to the problem and sure can make it more difficult for people to recover. And then you have the longer term public health issues of people who are now traumatized or coping in maybe not such great ways. Um, and you get family problems and work problems and all of that stuff, you know, kind right. of snowballs. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a not an easy to solve or easy to diagnose or easy to combat sort of issue because it's so multifaceted and, and variable, you know, and uh, idiosyncratic with everybody's experience. So, right. And, and so the, you know, in my mind, the one thing that we can do for everybody is to immediately validate that experience. Absolutely. And, and that's the place where empathy begins. Right. Exactly. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. Because it's, it's that, that we, that's, that, that's it. We figured it out because that's where the empathy begins, where dismissal ends and empathy begins. So yes. I think that that's, at least for this conversation, that's the, the opposing pair. I think so. <laughs> dismissal I, and empathy. Yes. Because even when you were talking about the, the, the mayor or the governor not responding to your letter, the word you used was dismissed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's gotta be what it is. Okay. Um, so I think you answered, I have this list of questions that I was going to ask you, but I think you answered all of them in that multifaceted explanation. Um, so, so you have a, a, a business as a, as a speaker, you've, you've spoken at conferences and you've um, really been taking this story publicly. Um, has that organically sort of turned itself into a business? Like, are you um, like a paid uh, keynote speaker now kind of thing? So yes, I am. And that all started again, sort of by accident, where somebody said to me, you know, I think you have a story to tell. Will you speak at this conference? And it was a friend of mine. And I looked at him and I said, you know, if you do all the logistics and figure everything out and just tell me what time to show up and where, I totally do it. 
Wow. And that Was that a started, big leap from an introverted person to go talk in front of a big audience? You know, it wasn't because I was so anxious to tell my story. And sure, so you were ready. Passionate. I was so ready for it that, that the, I think the typical jitters you might have for speaking in public just never even occurred to me. That's awesome. And I- that started the, that started the whole thing. I um, have an agent who helps me really? uh, book things. And um, I was so excited last year in 2019 to speak at South by Southwest. That was the biggest, uh, you know, stage that I had been on, um, although not the biggest audience. The biggest audience was at the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Conference. But I've, you know, I've spoken to groups of all sizes. And what I feel each time is, I know one person is going to be helped by this. At least one person is going to be helped by something that somebody in this audience heard. And Right. You know, I've, I've started to hear, I know some stories about where I've heard back that somebody was actually helped. Um, that's so I, that's how I started. And now I speak to um, corporations. I talk about trauma sensitive leadership. I talk about resiliency um, and uh, yeah, kind of making it work as a business. And that's very cool. I really enjoy the work and it's funny to say that when I stand on a stage and I talk about the worst moment of my life, and I know that it can be upsetting to people and triggering to people, but I get so much value out of it that I enjoy the process and I enjoy yeah. sharing this message with people. Because you know you're a compassionate, empathetic person and because you know that it's going to help other people to to lay that event vulnerable over and over again, you're doing it for a worthy good cause, you know, to, to help others and to improve the lives of other people. And that's, that to me, that's everything. It is. And you know, what's so funny is that I have stood in front of an audience of over 500 people and shared this and it is still, believe it or not, difficult for me to bring this up individually with people in my life who don't know that this has happened to me. I still get really nervous and it's hard for me to figure out how to tell them the story. Wow. So it's, it's, I've been able to kind of divide sort of the, the advocacy work and the telling of my story is kind of its own thing. But then when it's just me personally being vulnerable, it's a very different equation. Sure. Sure. There, there's a line when you're saying that there's a line in The Great Gatsby, the novel by F. Scott Fitzgerald, mm-hmm. um, where the character Jordan Baker says that she hates. I'm going to get it wrong. She hates. Small. No. I'm getting it backwards, I think. But something like she hates small parties because they're so intimate. She would prefer large parties because they're not as intimate. And, right. You know, and it's just the way she says it. It's just like so offhanded, you know, like, oh, I'm not doing that kind of thing, you know. And, and, and that's sort of what made me think of that. Like, here you are in this huge, intimidating sca- stage with a huge audience and you're like, easy peasy. And then you're like a one-on-one with somebody you're not as comfortable with. And it seems just so much more bearing. Yes. And so much more vulnerable. It does. I think it makes a lot of sense because you're, you know, like the way an actor in a way would put on a character and then perform it. You're sort of doing that when you're giving a speech that that's large. You've written it, you've practiced it, you've, you sort of know where your transitions are and what you're going to do. And even if there is a Q&A, you've thought about a- at least many of the possibilities of things that people might ask. But one-on-one changes the whole trajectory of that. Yes. And I actually sometimes feel like, you know, when I've made new friends, I just want to send them a link to a podcast or to one of my speeches and just be like, you read that, come back to me if you have any questions. Right, <laughs> right, right. I, I, I did that recently with a friend of mine who was asking me a story to tell a story that I wrote about extensively in my book. And, and I was just like, 
you know, just, just read it. I don't feel like explaining it again. Exactly. <laughs> it's all there, you know, or somebody said, oh, I, I, I'm sure you don't want to tell that story in public. And I'm like, are you kidding? It's in my book. The whole world has read it at this point. It's on every continent. I, I'm not shy, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, are you nuts? It's so funny. It's, it's interesting to me how different experiences that we all have or that we each have is probably a better sentence takes us on obviously different journeys, different paths, but along the same, the same goals, I think the same um, quest for being beneficial to other people to create meaning in our own lives through service to others. Um, and, and not, uh, to a, a selfless point where we're negating our own mental health or our own boundaries or the things that we need in our lives. But, but uh, companionably we're, we're taking care of ourselves and creating more meaning and connection and empathy in our own hearts by being there for others and by sharing those really sensitive, meaningful things with other people to hopefully inspire and be beneficial and help make their lives better. I, 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 to me, I, I think that's why you and I connected so quickly yes. um, because we have this both readily at the service of our hearts. Yes. And, you know, early on, I realized that on top of everything you just shared on top of wanting to help and, you know, prevent somebody else from having to feel what I felt telling my story was very validating. And it was, yeah, I was able to find the validation that I didn't get in the aftermath of the bombing and to get that visibility because, you know, people were seeing me and were hearing my story in a way that didn't happen, you know, here in the city in the aftermath. Right. And it was, I eventually realized that part of it was in addition to wanting to help others, it was also very therapeutic for me to share my story. Absolutely. As others lean in to hear, you're getting the empathy and you're getting the compassion and you're getting the respect that you have gone through. And it has evolved in, it caused you to evolve into somebody else in a way, yes. you know, a different version of uh, a different version of yourself. And, and so I think that even if we struggle with the powers that be and the leadership, getting to a point where more people have more access to these things. And, you know, this is going to be a bit of a struggle. It's everything, everything is, we have a huge country with a lot of diversity and to yes. get, to get everybody on the same page with anything is uh, an uphill battle for sure. But, but I, I think a big take home for this that is extremely valuable to us and, and all of the people who are listening is, is that we have the ability to give ourselves the compassion and the respect and the, um, the healing that we need by sharing our stories or through sharing our stories with other people. Um, and, and to me, that that puts all of us on the path to wellness. You know, when I was writing my book, I was reading writing some very, very personal, very traumatic experiences, and it was very cathartic. And as I know that other people are reading it, and I'm they're writing back to me, and I, I, it's starting conversations. Uh, uh, it's so healing all over again, you know. And I I think that we owe it to ourselves to keep sharing stories so that we can heal each other. Yes. And I like what you said about, you know, sharing our stories as an act of self-compassion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really like that thinking about it that way. And I hadn't put it in those terms to myself before. So I really like that. Oh, awesome. Excellent. So this has been a lovely, fabulous conversation. Um, if you could leave our listeners with one little piece of wisdom or advice or some inspirational thought, what might it be? So this is not original. I cannot claim this, but I, it is something that I 
go back to time and time again, which is that it is okay not to be okay. Yes, it is okay not to be okay. And I just want people to know that. And I think if we could all get to a point where we believed that, we might not even have to have these kind of conversations because people would be leading with that compassion for themselves and for others. Right, right. And when somebody says, hey, Manya, how are you? You don't have to just have that boilerplate, I'm fine statement. Yes. You know? If you said, gee, Marcy, you know, shit's hit the fan today. I don't really know what to do. I, I, I'm going to stop and listen, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just, okay, great. I'm so glad things are fine and just keep going. You know, yeah. I think we need to answer these questions truthfully, you know, and not just say things are okay when they're not. You know, like how many times has somebody asked you if you're all right and you know you're not, but you don't know how to say that you're not? Yeah. Countless times. Yeah, and that's exactly the that. same thing that you just said. You know, I just said it in a slightly different way. And I, I do think that we need to figure out how to say that, how to open ourselves up and say, look, Manya, I'm having an awful day. I could use somebody to listen. And I'm sure you would, you know, so I think that's great. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. I, I just absolutely enjoy this conversation um, so much so that it's a little longer than the other episodes and I don't care because it was chock full of phenomenal, phenomenal um, um, wisdom and compassion and um, wonderfulness. So I am going to link um, your website and social media contacts and all of that stuff on the bottom in the show notes underneath uh, where this appears on the podcast. And um, so if people want to get in touch with you or hire you as a speaker, um, they all know how to do that. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I totally loved every second of this conversation. Oh, thank you, Mark Marcy. I loved this conversation and I loved your questions. And I think you know how much I enjoy talking to you. So it yeah. was just a thrill to be part of the podcast. Yay. Excellent. So this was episode four. I'm so glad that you all hung in here with us and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, and remember uh, different episodes, new episodes launch or drop, I guess is the word every Wednesday. And um, I'm so glad you're here with us. So remember to give yourself permission to heal. <laughs>